take your Bibles and be turning with me. Hang on. You take your Bibles and be turning with me to John chapter 12. And uh, Barry and I, upon further discussion after last week, we're giving the, uh, the, the wireless mic a, a try because last week we tried this microphone. And so when I stood here and spoke, I echoed. And then I came over here and I didn't. And when I get disoriented with sound like this, that'll bother me. Some of y'all with small children think that, you know, crying, wrestling, baby bother me. I can, I bother a baby, but I, that, a baby doesn't bother me, but that, that kind of thing throws me off. So that, you know, threw me off a little bit last week. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Uh, we want to take a look at this, actually, we're going to look mainly at 24 through 33. And so when you find John chapter 12, verse 24, if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word. We'll start with uh, verse 23. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have been both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And, if, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you will bless the reading of this, your word. That you will help us to draw from it what you have. And apply it well to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I have here, I went to Walmart this week, and I bought corn. Anybody want to bite? <laughs> Seriously. It says it's got a smooth, sweet taste. Nobody wants to. I brought lunch. Now, y'all, it's a quarter to, quarter to noon already. And I, you know, I've worked on the sermon all week, so I got it down from an hour and a half to 45 minutes. But <laughs> if you didn't come to men's breakfast or you didn't get down there and help clean up leftovers, you know, if, if, if you didn't, you might get a little snacky. So anybody, anybody want some corn? Nobody really wants to eat this. No parents want their children to eat this because your dental plan does not cover kid knocked out two to on corn seeds. <laughs> We all would look at this and say, that's not really what we want. And in fact, the goal of this little packet of seeds is not even that to plant one of these into the ground results in one nice big kernel of corn to eat. It's not even that this would grow and just get big. The purpose, in fact, of this dry, hard, really unpleasant stuff. Okay? You don't have to put it in your mouth to know that. You can squeeze it. And know that biting on that would be bad. The purpose of that hard, unpleasant <coughs> stuff is that you can put it in the ground and it would change and come out. You would put it in the ground is one thing. And then what comes from it is actually something with a nice, smooth, sweet taste. Now, I'll be honest, if I can keep the possums from eating all these once they grow up, this will make a few meals worth of corn for the, for the family. Some to share and that type of thing. Because that's what its purpose is. Jesus compares 
our life to a grain of wheat, and I decided to go with corn because corn was bigger, and also Walmart didn't sell wheat seeds. <laughs> I didn't know if there's anybody around that I could get wheat seed from, so no, I'm kidding. I knew there were several of y'all I could have gotten some from, but uh, I didn't want to plant wheat in the backyard after, after the sermon was over, so I, I, I'm out for two purposes here. I, I used corn just because y'all can picture that. You can see that. Because that's what Jesus is talking about, is the idea of something that you plant as a seed that has to go into the ground, be buried, be changed, and come forth. He tells us this first to talk about his burial. The disciples, and I love the apostles, the twelve disciples, they're ordinary people who take four years to understand something that was explained to them in one. And that fits well with me. It takes them some time. In fact, when we see on down here one of the, one of the great verses, and, and you see this from time to time in the Gospel of John, you see this down in, in verse 33 where he says, where John writes, he was saying this to indicate the kind of death he would, he would die. Jesus didn't tell John that right at the very beginning. John realizes this later as he's writing the Gospel of John. Now we think Jesus is crucified somewhere between 27 and 33 A.D. And if you'd like to get really bored, we could talk about all of the how we figure that out at another time. We also figure that John doesn't write his gospel until somewhere between 85 and 90 A.D. So it takes John about 60 years of thinking about it to realize when Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw a man unto me, to realize that, oh, he was talking about the cross. Draw a little bit of comfort in that, folks, if there are things that happen to you in moments that occur in your life, times that you've looked at the Word of God and said, I just don't get it, and then later on in life, you understand it better. You go, I wish I'd understood that 30 years ago. The Apostle John had things he didn't understand in 30 years. And he had Jesus to teach him. When he went to, and listened to a sermon on Sunday for three years, he didn't listen to me. He listened to Jesus. It still took him a while to get it. So it's okay. Jesus tells us this about the, the, the wheat, though. He says he, the burial of Jesus is compared to planting a piece of wheat or a seed for a grain. He says, this is what, you know, I have to go. I have to do this. And the apostles don't get it yet. They really don't. They, they still don't understand what the purpose is that Jesus has come for. They're going to come and they come in the next couple of weeks. They'll go through Palm Sunday. <coughs> we'll remember next Sunday our choir will sing and present. And it's the Sunday that we remember Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the crowd shouts Hosanna. And people are taking their coats off and laying them at his feet so that he, not even the donkey he's riding on has to touch the ground. And they're waving palm branches. And it's this giant celebration. It is like the, the ticker tape parade of the ancient Near East. It is this picture of, of glory and acceptance and, and the welcoming of a king. It is the same way that we would behave if a beloved hero was coming to town. And then within a week, Jesus goes to the cross and dies. And the disciples just are having some trouble understanding what's happening, but to set up for it, to help them understand it as it comes. Jesus says, I have to die and be buried. Because just like that grain of wheat isn't any value until you bury it, neither am I. Now, if you think that the main thing Jesus came to do was to come teach some great principles and live a nice moral life and tell us all these sorts of things about how we can love each other and tell us how God loves us and came just to preach, then you have missed the point. He came and he did all those things and he did, that, did all of that well. He did that in a way that no one ever did before. No one ever has done since then. When we look at Scripture, when we look at the Old Testament, we see the prophets preaching and talking about who, what God is like. We see that they're pointing forward to Jesus. When we see the rest of the New Testament, we see Paul and Peter preach. They're looking back at Jesus. And ever since then, what do preachers do? We look back at Jesus. We don't make up any new stuff. When we do, we go wrong. That's how you get these loons on television that think they're entitled to $65 million. 
Because they're making up stuff that has no connection to Jesus. But he taught, he preached from a standpoint of always being right. And yet that was not the purpose for which he came. God could have sent more prophets. He could have sent others to teach. But he sent him so that he would die and be buried. Jesus says here, unless I'm buried, I don't actually become what I ought to be. I don't actually show you what I came to do. First thing his death was for, Jesus' death was to atone for our sins, but not only to atone for our sins, but to show us what happens in our death. It's the great thing about starting service with baptism. I already got half a sermon in. You already saw it. Now I get to explain it to you again. It's a reminder. Jesus says, here's what happens. You die, you're buried. And you're raised to be more, to be glorifying God. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Unless he had died and risen again, all Jesus would have had were twelve disciples. But because he rose again and made atonement for our sins, made it so that we could be right with God, the Holy Spirit can live in us and bear as much fruit. The same thing with us. Unless we're willing to let our present life die and bury it, we will never become what we're intended to be. Burial of who we are, the burial of our current life is necessary for us to become who God intends us to be. Many of us live lives as Christians that we never really get much past the little seed stage. This ends up being all we ever think about is, well, this is just, this is what I am. <coughs> but what God has intended for us to be is to let that be buried with Christ and sprout up. Because what happens with that? Well, as you're tended by the, by the good seed, by the good spirit, you grow up in the word and the light of the sun, you sprout, and then you bear much fruit. How much fruit? Black hair is perfect. How much fruit? Well, I've never counted the actual number of kernels on a corn cob. But I know this. It's at least dozens, if not more, from just one of these. What is that fruit that we bear? That fruit ranges from <coughs> new seeds that grow up as we draw others to Christ, to the fruit of the Spirit that comes in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. to being able to live in peace and harmony with our neighbors, whether we like them or not, to strengthen our families and our homes. All of this is the fruit that comes from walking in the righteousness of Christ. And it all starts with realizing that the life that we have right now isn't just better off if we're buried that's the only point that it's got. Walmart doesn't sell these in the grocery section. They do sell some seeds in the grocery section. Some of y'all looking at saying, I saw a rack of seeds over there now, preaching in line. They didn't sell these over there, all right? They had some others. They don't sell these big bags of corn seeds over there. Because you're not supposed to eat this. It's not its purpose at all. Its purpose is to be buried and grow up into something else. Your purpose is to be buried with Christ, to be crucified with Christ, and to live to Him. Why? Because the glory of God is found not in us remaining who we are, not in us being who we think we ought to be, but in becoming what God has created us, designed us, intended for us to become. Now we find that sometimes by looking at well, what has God made me good at. Some of you, God has made you so that you can sing. 
And one way you glorify God is by strengthening and using that talent. Some of us, we are not made that way. And so we don't. Some of us, God has made, some of you, God has made gifted in other areas. You can fix things. You can build things. You can make things. You can cook things. Some of you are gifted in the fact that you can work with children. Someone asked me one time about working with uh, elementary school students. I said, there's not enough duct tape in the world for me to work with elementary school students every day of the week. <laughs> there's just not. I love children. <laughs> I'm glad to talk to children, I'm glad to play with children, and I'm glad for children to go on about their life. <laughs> Kids are fun for a while. Some of you, though, you could imagine going, to, going for several days without spending a lot of time with kids. You love it. God made you that way. And part of learning how to glorify God with your life is becoming who God made you to be with that. Some of you are good with other age groups or other needs, other, other issues. Some of you have a good head for organization or for business, and God uses that. Some of you are creative. I mentioned at prayer time about trying to put some information out about missionaries so that we can be aware of what's going on and, and know how to pray for folks who are around the world spreading the gospel. And seriously, if I did it, there'd be a free ring binder sitting on the front pew here with just nothing but black and white text in it. And you'd fall asleep reading the cover by the time you got to the, by the time you got to the end of it. And so other people who have some creativity and some ability to make things look pretty are working on that. Thank you. Because I don't have that. All of these things we learn to use how God has made us. Some things we have to put aside. Some of us, if you, let, if you leave us alone there, but for the grace of God, we go to selfishness, self-centeredness. We can be angry, we can be self-absorbed. Self Some of us like to just kind of hold off by ourselves and never talk to people. Well, guess what? God has made, has made us certain ways, but certain things about us are just because of the sin so world we live in. We have to get over those and let the Spirit of God work through us. So what has God made for you? I can't fully answer that. My original plan was to buy about a half a dozen packets of seed, and mix them all up, and just kind of hold it up and point out that you know you can't just tell by looking at it what it's going to become. But then I thought we've got some master gardeners, we got some farm folks, we got some some seed fertilizer specialists, and somebody's going to sit back there and go, actually, yeah, that was corn, that was cucumber, that was a petunia. <laughs> and so I, I figured it was just going to kind of die as, as, as an illustration, so I didn't make it. But really and truly, every one of us is unique. God wired us differently. He created us with skills and gifts and abilities. The one thing that I can assure you, though, is what Jesus says. If our obsession is about holding on to the life that we have, chasing after the pleasures that we want to have all the time, then we'll lose all that and we'll never become who God created us to be. But if we are willing to go to the cross with Jesus, take His atonement for our sins and surrender to Him as Lord, then not only will we truly find life in this world, we'll find fruit and we'll find life eternal. So the question for you today is, what do you want? Do you want to keep living dry and empty? Or do you want to have a purpose? Do you want to have a life that glorifies God? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here today. We ask the Lord to guide us as your people. Help us to walk well with Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Come to time.